Let's look now a little bit in more detail on how this works. And we're going to we're going to focus on some fundamentals of sediment transport. So this is valid for carbonates and plastic, but we'll of course focus on carbonates. So transport of sediments in the ocean is mostly due to wave action. And you have two types of wave as you know, you have the storm waves and you have the fair weather waves. And both of these have a wave base at which, you know, the particles are agitated. Okay, so remember a wave is like a big circle that uh, basically uh, transport the water and the, and the sediments. Now, if you look at the wave frequency spectrum of the added storm wave base and the fair weather wave base over a year or several, uh, several years, you will have a frequency spectrum that has this shape where effectively the maximum wave energy is somewhat below wave base or somewhat just at the base of the fair weather wave base. This is where you have most of the wave energy distributed over time. Now, the, the thing is, this wave energy gives you fluid power. Now, to understand sediments, you also have to add the sediment input into the system. So the combination of the fluid power and the types and amount of sediment gives you a shelf equilibrium profile. In other words, the shelf will reach equilibrium to basically accommodate for both the fluid power and the sediment input. So let's look in detail how this works. And the first step is to understand that if you have a wave energy or a combination of wave energy, that wave energy has the potential to transport um, sediment to a certain grain size. And if you have a very deep wave base, you're able to transport the sediments for a very long distance. So you'll tend to separate grain sizes from coarse towards the, the, the coast to much finer towards the basin. So as you see, this is a very basic concept in, in sedimentology. But of course, if your wave is less strong, then you'll have a tendency of transporting your sediment only to a certain extent into your basin and not further. So, so fundamental concept here, but bear with me because we'll have to apply this now to the next, uh, the next thinking step. And this next thinking step is the concept of hydraulic competence. So here, what you see is a profile where we have depth on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, we have different grain sizes. So here, what uh, Pomar does is he uses terminology that are similar to plastic. So he looks at grain size in terms of mud, silt, sand, gravel, boulder. And then of course, because we're interested in carbonates, he also looks at framestone. Framestone are the bound stone of the Dunham classification. So these are ordered now on the horizontal axis from smallest to largest, framestone being not only the largest, but also cemented together at deposition. So very resistant to transport and wave erosion. And then for any hydraulic power, there comes a hydraulic competence. In other words, the hydraulic competence is the ability of a certain hydraulic power to transport a given grain size or a maximum grain size it can transport. So that black dash line there is this hydraulic competence for a particular location. The hydraulic competence, as you can see, is highest slightly below wave base. We've discussed why this was the case. This comes from the wave frequency. And the idea is that anything that's below the hydraulic competence line will be transported away from the site of deposition and everything that is above will be kept um, at the, the site of deposition. So it will be a, an autochthonous type of deposit. Okay, now comes the sediment input. So if in carbonates you produce all of your sediment at the surface, you will have in terms of production a range of grain sizes and in this case, it's suggested that we go from mud all the way to boulders. We have no framestone. And now if you pair the hydraulic competence 
curve with this sediment input, what Pomar suggests is that anything at the site of production that plots above the hydraulic competence will be kept. So that means that at the surface we'll have gravel to boulder um, sediments or gravel, um, um, gravel dominated sediments. But then everything that's below the competence curve will be transported further down the shelf profile until itself falls above the hydraulic competence curve. So that means that the sand will be transported further down and then the silt will be transported even further down and finally the mud will be transported very deep into this, this shelf. And this then gives you by default a, an equilibrium profile for your shelf where everything's transported and distributed according to the grain size of the input, so the sediment input and the hydraulic competence at that particular location. Now, we're focused here on carbonates. So let's look at production of carbonates. And production can be distingu distinguished between the type of producers we have. So typically, euphotic biota that require a lot of light will produce mostly at the top of the water column. Oligophotic biota, which are the ones that thrive in conditions where you have some light but you're not in the light saturation zone, will thrive deeper and produce sediment deeper in the water column. And aphotic biota will produce sediment throughout the water column with perhaps a little bit of a preference of uh, the shallow water because there's more nutrients there and so they're able to, to um, eat and grow better. So light penetration determines what biota produces where. So how is that relevant now for the shelf equilibrium profile? Well, let's imagine that we have a system dominated by euphotic biota. So if we have only euphotic biota, we'll have a hydraulic competence curve here. We'll use the same hydraulic competence curve for all of our example. And our production will be focused on the top of the water column with anything be ranging between mud. Remember, tea factory produces a lot of mud all the way to frame stones. Now, everything that plots above the, water, the um, hydraulic competence line will be kept in situ. So that means that the uh, gravel, boulder, and frame stone will stay in situ in this case and will be building up, um, essentially building up the profile. But all the finer grains will be transported and will be building out. In other words, prograding into the system. Now this is different if you have a system that is dominated by oligophotic organisms. So we keep the same hydraulic competence curve, but what you can see is because in oligophotic cases we produce deeper in the water column, well, you end up with a building up deeper on the, the, uh, the profile of this particular shelf or ramp, and you also build out by, by removing the sediments that are actually below the um, hydraulic competence line. And there's also an area here where the sediments that were deposited um, above in terms of, of uh, water depth are too small, so they're below the hydraulic competence line and they're moved deeper into the profile. So you have at that location a mix between things that are produced in situ and things that are transported. So you can immediately understand here with these two examples, A and B, how this would impact the profile of, of a particular ramp. You can see that the type of organisms that we have will have a profound impact with the same hydraulic um, competence curve, will have a profound impact on the ultimate geometry of a um, system because of course where we deposit the sediments impacts the geometry of the system.